You're listening to Nakedly Examined Music, a podcast about songs and songwriters. My name is Mark Lintonmeyer. My guest for today is Radney Foster, who started in the late 80s with three albums by Foster and Lloyd. And you are right now listening to Crazy Over You from their self-titled 1987 LP. He has since released about a dozen albums plus one Foster and Lloyd reunion album. Today we're going to be discussing two songs from his new, well, 2017 For You to See the Stars album. Those will be Sycamore Creek and Raining on Sunday, which is actually a re-recorded song from his 1999 See What You Want to See album. We'll then be looking back to his first big single, Nobody Wins, from the album Del Rio, Texas, 1959, the album is from 1992. For more information, please visit RadneyFoster.com. For more about this podcast, visit NakedlyExaminedMusic.com. And if you want to support what we're doing, consider contributing at Patreon.com slash NakedlyExaminedMusic. All right, so I will have played a little bit of Crazy Over You by Foster and Lloyd from your self-titled album 1987 to... Remind folks of the beginning of your career, uh, we're going to get very quickly to the new stuff, to a couple songs from For You to See the Stars 2017. Do you want to say something briefly about that long journey? About the 30 years in between? <laughs> if there's something that is worth saying in less than a minute. It has been a great ride. I mean, I have zero complaints, but it has been a roller coaster ride. I mean, and I think that's the thing that they don't tell you you know, there's well. Apparently, now there is a university where you can go to major in rock and roll. I always thought you dropped out of college to get in the music business, or at least that's how you did it back when I was in college. There's always going to be, no matter how big or small your career is, wherever it is along the way, there's always these curveballs that life throws. You know, the way you make your living has to do with writing about that and then also living through it. And then, you know, royalty streams really helped with sort of smoothing out that roller coaster ride. But even with that, there's always ups and downs that come through things in any career. And then I, I think it's even tougher for young people today because the royalty streams are so much smaller. You know, they're either really big or they're almost non-existent. There's kind of no middle ground left. So we should talk about this fairly recent dip in your fortunes where you lost your voice for a bit, and that's what resulted right, in you actually starting to write, which is why we have the current album in its current form, which is a 10 or 11 songs with exactly that many short stories that go with them. Say a little about that process. Yeah, it's called For You to See the Stars. And actually, what happened was is in the winter of 2015, 16, like, you know, right before Christmas and leading into January, I lost my voice completely because of bronchitis that went into pneumonia. I just basically coughed my voice gone and I could not speak for six weeks. And then I had to have about six weeks worth of vocal therapy. It wasn't like they just said, oh, if you'll just do this for 12 weeks, you'll be fine. It was go back to the doctor each week and they would say, no, you still can't talk. No, you still can't talk. Now you can start to do, you know, you can talk for 15 minutes. You can do scales for three minutes and don't push and then shut up for two more hours, you know? And then, I mean, it was just this progressive thing for weeks and going back to a voice coach and seeing how much could I accomplish, how healed up was I, all that kind of stuff was just kind of shaky ground for a long time. And that was like an existential crisis for me. I was really flipped out. So probably week four, I think I wrote a note to my wife you know, because the only way I could communicate with my wife and kids was to write notes. And I wrote a note to my wife and said, I think there is a short story in a song called Sycamore Creek that I wrote six months ago. And I'm going to write it just to keep from going crazy. And she didn't answer me. She picked up the pen out of my hand and wrote down, you should because you're driving me crazy. And that was the beginning of my literary career right there. So, Well, yeah, let's play that. Do you have a few introductory words to set the stage for this before they hear it? The song is really about, it's nostalgic, but it's going to walk you through 15 years of a couple's lives, starting with skinny dipping in a pool. I can see her in that wall. Church dress hung up in a tree Splashing, flirting, laughing, teasing me An afternoon of seeds Swimming naked in a pool of dreams 
Last high school summer dripping dry by Sycamore Creek. She kissed me one last time, heading home. And I'm still haunted by what she said when I'm alone. She said, You got a chance to be free of all these small town strings. They tie the rest of us down. This is boy, quit your hanging around. Take that guitar and run faster than the setting sun. You can write a song later about my memory. You can always come back. You can always come back to Sycamore Creek. Well, the guitar made the magic And I just hung on for the ride I walked amongst giants Played with legends side by side She came to see me in New Orleans And on a tour bus after the show I kissed goodbye the one I never should have let go Stage lights in every town Hey look where you're hanging around Take that guitar and run Faster than the setting sun You can write a song later about my memory You can always come back Well, I knew she'd gotten married And I always forget the guy's name But he played tight in the year that we won district It got bad and it got ugly Through tears one night she called me And I drove ten hours to the water I couldn't resist it
So let's talk about the story and then we can get to the actual music. So yeah, it's funny, the story that the song starts at that point and goes forward, whereas the story, you throw a little bit of that scene right up front, but then it actually goes backward quite a few years. So it's like you're filling in another 20 years or, you know, of these folks' lives. I think one of the things that I really realized as I started writing and thinking about the song, I thought, if I just mirror the song, it's 15 years of these people's lives because, you know, it starts out, you know, they're skinny dipping the summer after high school. And then this guy follows his dreams with his guitar and they meet somewhere along the way in New Orleans. And that carries the thing forward. And then, you know, years later, she's married and it's a terrible marriage. And he drives to the place on Sycamore Creek where they first went skinny dipping and meets her there and gives her 10 grand in a, you know, in cash in a bag and says, get the hell out of here, basically, you know, is a sort of the way I envisioned it. And I thought, that's a novel. That's at least three or 400 pages. And I wasn't ready to tackle that. And I was just truly doing it just to keep from going crazy because I was so sick. So I thought, okay, why don't we do really what's their senior year? I think it starts with their sophomore year, but really it's just about this senior year. And it's about these three kids in a small town in West Texas who play music together. It begins and ends, the short story does, with the summer after high school. So then the song carries the story forward from there for the next decade and a half. So it seems like this causes you to reinterpret that initial scene that, you know, it sounds like, you know, it's little ditty about Jack and Diane sucking on a tasty free, you know, this carefree thing. Yeah, you get to the end and people are going, oh, shit. You know, there, there's, <laughs> it was really fun to play the song before it was recorded and people didn't know it. And, and still, you know, you go to a, one of my shows and half the audience has all the new music or has maybe studied the new record, but the other half hasn't, you know, and I've been... They're like, oh my God, Rodney Foster's playing. It's like, you know, they're just showing up because they're longtime fans and they don't see it coming. It's a sucker punch when they're like, oh my God, they don't get together in the end. I mean, it's a happy ending in that, you know, basically she sacrifices her love for him because she says, go follow your dreams. I can't do that. I'm not following you around, you know, I'm staying here. And that gets somewhat explicated in the short story as well. And then... It gets to the end and, you know, she's in a bad marriage and he kind of saves her because he's done well enough in life and willing to sacrifice some serious cash to get her to head out of town and start a new life where that guy can't beat the hell out of her anymore. So that narrative structure makes sense. But then just also then throwing in what happens in the story charges that initial scene up with so much more drama. It's not just splash and flirt and laugh and tease in. Like you did have a little bit of that in the story, but it's like as a catharsis from these horrible things. Well, yeah, I mean, that's it's pretty sexual towards the end there. I mean, the backstory is about three kids in West Texas and there are two guys and a, and a gal and they all sing together and there are lots of complications and there's a couple of tragedies that take place within the town and it creates a lot of tension between these two. You know, you realize at the end of the story that these two really love each other as friends and yet there's always sexual tension between them. And I think that's a lot like life. I mean, you don't know some kids are smart enough to know it's like the likelihood of me marrying my high school girlfriend is pretty slim. But there's a lot of kids who don't, you know, especially in small towns, too. It's like, oh, you graduate from high school, you get married and have babies and get a job at the factory. There's always that tension sitting around. And I think the thing that's really great about the characters in Sycamore Creek in, in particular is that Maggie realizes this is not going to last forever. We're going to love each other forever. But we're not going to be together forever. That's not how this is going to work out. And she's aware of it. And I, I think that makes for an interesting character. It makes her a little more complex. So where did the, this is not really giving anything away to the, the potential reader, the secret Latino heritage that the main character has here. This serves as one of the things that is a secret that they can share. You know, one of the confessions that he can make to her to bring them closer. And that seems to be the overall plot function. But like, it already had plenty of tension without that detail. Say a little about, you know, the decision to include that whole part of it. I know, friends, I was born and raised in Del Rio, Texas. My house was literally a mile from the Rio Grande. The easiest way for me to sort of have that as a plot line was growing up. I knew people who hid their Hispanic Mexican heritage that was not confessed until they were 30 or 40 years old. 
because their parents were terrified that it would make them second-class citizens, that they wouldn't have as many advantages. And this is in the 1970s. And since I put it in that, I thought, you know what, that makes him a more interesting character. You know, it puts a, a whole bunch of enmity between him and his dad. Essentially, his dad's a bigot. And yet his dad married a woman who is half of the old German. You know, in, in, in central Texas, there's lots and lots of German immigrants. Starting in the 1830s and 40s, they started coming over in droves. It was a way to populate northern Mexico, essentially, at the time. And uh, he's got that ancestry, and yet he's got the ancestry of, he's got a grandmother who's from Mexico. And that wasn't uncommon. But if you had an Anglo-Saxon or a German last name, and you were fair-skinned, you might hide that fact. Until recently, and now, thankfully, we've progressed somewhat past that, although I'm not sure at times. But I just thought it made for a more interesting character. And you don't get any of that from the song. I mean, the thing is that in a song, most songs are snapshots. The, the thing that I loved about writing the song Sycamore Creek was sort of, I was really thinking about Towns Van Zandt's Poncho and Lefty and how that takes place over decades, right? And yet he tells it in a series of 20 Polaroids laid down. It's a little movie in that you understand it. There's these huge gaps of things you don't understand and don't know about. But you don't have to because you're sucked in and he spits you out at the end with the tragedy of it all. And yet it's only 20 scenes or 20 lines that inform you because the rest of it's chorus. Right. You know, so it's what informs you of those time structures. And so that's what I was trying to think about doing lyrically when I was writing Sycamore Creek. It's like, ah, I really the first thing I had was just skinny dipping with a girl. And I thought, OK, well, I didn't want it to be Jack and Diane. You know, you know what I mean? I'm like, like, oh God, okay, that's a cool opening line. I can see her in that water church dress hung up in a tree, laughing, flirting, splashing, teasing me. I mean, I thought, okay, that's a cool opening to a song, but take them further than just high school romance. So what about the marriage between that opening set of lines and this really great, I guess it's a drop D guitar line, nice little slidey thing that you introduce? That's a Steve Cropper lick, really. Steve always did them on the, the first string and the third string, and it's really rolling harmonies up chord positions, starting like with a G position, and then you can go up. Your next place would be, you know, an A minor, and you know, then a, a B minor, then on up to a C. He's rolling those, just the notes that are on that. And you hear that kind of thing on Soul Man, the opening to Soul Man. I mean, that's all he's doing. And all I did was find the place for it out of the D. It's a drop D tuning. And, you know, you can play a regular D, but you can also play a C and slide it up two frets, right? And you're still making a D chord. Well, it's just the bottom part of that. And so I thought, oh, if you start there and you can slide it up like Steve Cropper, that's a cool head lick. And that little lick, and then I kind of thought, okay, that's a cool thing to start with for a ballad. And then I kind of had to put the guitar down to be able to find what I wanted to sing about. And I think I wandered around my neighborhood with a pad and a piece of paper and came up with that first line about skinny dipping after church. The beginning of that is just guitar and vocal, which this could very well be. You do a lot of solo gigs at this point, right? Oh, I do. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. So that's become one of the most popular songs off the. It hasn't gotten played on the radio all that much because it's longish. Although Americana stations will, you know, that kind of play everything, especially in, in Texas, too. So it has gotten some play, but that's become a real fan favorite live just because when people get the record, it's the one that's stuck in people's heads. So while it was really just a couple of others that sort of got more radio airplay, that's become a huge fan favorite. I think, it, And I think it's because of the story within the song. And then if they've gotten the book and read the book, I think it adds so much flesh to it that people really kind of fall in love with that whole thing together. So it seems like you consider the song complete. Its essence is out there just with your part. So say a little about how this made its particular journey to the final recorded version that we have here in terms of the choices of, okay, how many guitars are going to come in? How long is the solo going to be? I didn't have credits for this. Uh, did you co-produce this like the last one? Oh, yeah. Produced it with Will Kimbrough. Okay. But really, Will Kimbrough was... And Will was playing one electric guitar, and then Eddie Heinzelman, who plays live with me, was playing the other guitar, and then we had... The lap steel, or...? It's actually, yeah, it is lap steel from Steve Fischel. 
And the keys were, you know, sort of minimalist. When I played the song for the band, Will's exact words were, gentlemen, your job is to stay out of the way of that. One of those things where it's like, okay, don't get too precious about this. Well, that's why it's kind of amazing. So the let me just play the end of the song. It was fun to be there and let those guys kind of do their thing. That's live vocal and guitar on my part. There is a way to do that and cut them up and then have everybody sort of redo their parts and that kind of stuff. Basically, I got the take and people sort of made their true confessions about if they had any slip ups along the way. But that's probably the third take on the whole thing. With you and three guitarists all playing at the same time while you're doing your lead vocal. I mean, there's a lot of empty space. You realize that Will's playing more of a baritone Eddie's playing a Les Paul, but he's doing it with real chimey high end and staying out of and some throaty sorts of big rake in the choruses. It's about realizing that when you're in that situation as a session guy, not that I am that often, but I am every now and then, where I'm not the artist. I and mean, my whole thing is always what not to play is just as important as what you do play. I mean, if you're the guy who was on the session for my girl and the only thing you did as a guitar player Let's go. Your job is done. It didn't matter if you played not another note because there were two other guitar players on that session. You didn't have to play anything else. If that was all you did, then you did it right. Since we're talking about this, the guitar solo here. So even that was not planned, you're saying, (laughs) because that's just so tasteful and precise. I think he took a path when the piano player wanted to take one down again from the top. Mm -hmm. They playlisted what he had done before, and he took a pass from the top. And then it's like, oh, yeah, that works. Eddie, who's playing in my band, all the guys in my band, really. I mean, they're both from Austin and Nashville. They're all world class players. And they don't call this town Guitar Town for nothing. I see concerts at the Ryman or Bridgestone and the guys are going, I know that half of these people can outplay me who are in this town, you know. And Will's really good about putting together people and, you know, sort of casting before you ever get there. Players who sort of know how to stay in their lane. There's other songs where it was very obvious that it's like, okay, this is a free-for-all and it's going to be really fun and we don't have to worry too much about it. Just let it rumble down the road and and see what happens and mute things if you have to later. Well, I noticed on this one, Sycamore Creek, this is pretty much the end of the album, but then you have right after this an instrumental reprise of the same thing. So was that just kind of a jam session, that little extra bit that you put in there? Yeah, that actually happened after the end of the take. Is I knew that felt really good, and then I thought we were going to do an additional take. A lot of times it's like you can just keep rolling, and sure. if I start it again, it's like, oh, They're like, all right, he's going to sing it again, just so we have two to look at when we go in there. So I started that lick again, and the guys all just fell in. And then I realized about eight, nine, ten bars down the beginning of that, I I was like, oh, this is just going to be a reprise. This is great. And then the reprise ended up being so cool that that was just a jam session that happened. We gave it its own track so that if somebody wanted to play Sycamore Creek on the radio, they didn't have to play 11 and a half minutes of something. (laughs) Hey, now let's stop and talk about a couple of sponsors. The first one of which is Dollar Shave Club, a very good alternative to having to purchase your bathroom essentials at the grocery or drugstore and maybe not always being sure of the quality you're getting. They offer really high quality products, not just in shaving, but deodorant, tooth cleaning products, shower products hair styling products, hand cream, cologne. They've got you covered from head to toe, and they can keep you automatically stocked on the products you used. You get what you want whenever you need it, whether that's once a month or a few times a year. 
I can personally attest to the quality of their razors and have tried both their shave lather and their shave butter and their prep scrub. Good stuff. And right now you can put the quality of Dollar Shave Club's products to the test yourself. Their ultimate starter shave set has basically everything you need for an amazing shave. The executive razor, shave butter, prep scrub, and post shave do. The best part is you can try it for just $5. After that, the restock box ships regular sized products at regular prices. Get your ultimate starter set for just $5 at dollarshaveclub.com slash N-E-M. That's dollarshaveclub.com slash N-E-M. Do I ever get tired of telling you about Masterclass? No, because I have not exhausted exploring even the music courses within this great library of over 70 courses, including stuff like Space Exploration with Chris Hadfield, the former commander of the International Space Station, where there's a brand new course by Chris Voss, the former FBI lead hostage negotiator on the art of negotiation. So these are video lectures by many of some of the most cherished personalities that we have in the entertainment world. So you can become a better writer, a better photographer, a better cook. A masterclass all-access pass is going to be something that you're definitely going to want to check out and makes an excellent, very personal gift, which is very convenient because right now when you buy one all-access pass, you get a second one for free. And this time in the music area, I ventured outside of my comfort zone to watch some lectures by Itzhak Perlman as he teaches violin, where he starts right at the beginning for absolutely beginner players to get you in good habits in how you bow, your intonation, your vibrato, your comfort and posture. And then he gets into playing different styles, how to collaborate with other musicians, how to pursue a career in music. And it's not just the lectures. There's a community so you can meet your fellow students. You can read the advice of all the other people taking the class with a 55-page class workbook. Again, this is only one of about a dozen courses in the music category and would be worth the price of admission on its own. But you really need to get an annual Masterclass All Access Pass. And again, when you get one for yourself, you get another one to gift for free. Go to masterclass.com slash examined to get started with this limited time offer. Don't miss your opportunity to get the best deal of the year. Buy one All Access Pass and one free to gift at masterclass.com slash examined. Let's get the second song out here, Raining on Sunday. So the version that we're going to include in full is also from that session for you to see the stars. But I do want to hear about how this evolved from the previous See What You Want to See, with 1998, I believe, right? Sure. And then also there's having Keith Urban's version out there in the ether, it, you know, informs the whole thing, too. Like a time that never lets up on you. Who said life was easy? Job is never through. It'll run us till we're ragged. It'll harden our hearts. Love could use a day of rest before we both start falling apart. Pray that is a rain and all. Storming like crazy We'll hide under the covers all afternoon Baby, whatever comes Monday Take care of yourself Cause we've got better things that we can do When it's raining on Sunday In Mexico, your kiss is like the incense of a prayer nail to the door. I surrender is much sweeter when we both let go. Let the water wash our bodies clean and love wash our souls.
Let's actually start with the music on this, since it'll probably be a shorter story, since it's the same group of people, the same approach, right? I mean, you've got a much longer jam right up front than on the previous version. That was a happy accident. We had cut, you know, there were several songs that we knew weren't going to need, or a couple few that we thought, well, it won't need, and one in particular on the record that it's like, I don't even know if it's going to need keys or not. This thing may be a wire choir, and one of them was real bluegrassy, and so we thought, let's cut those in the morning and then have the keys guy come in in the afternoon, and if either of those two songs need keys, he can just overdub them. So Robbie Crowell, who played keys on the record, had come in, and he was getting set up at the B3, and they were trying to get sounds and get his rig sort of together over at the B3, and we were just jamming to give him something to play to, and he misread the chart. The intro is different on that song because he was playing the first line of the verse. And then I realized, oh, he's missed that the chart starts with the, just a six minor to four chord, six minor to four. And I'm like, that's fine. Let's just jam on this thing. And while they're getting sounds and then, you know, we can stop and correct it. Well, the jam was going so well. I thought I just need to start singing. I'm really dumb if I don't take advantage of this situation because they've got this incredible vibe going. It's totally unlike my previous recording of it, which is good as well. So I just started and we cut a lot of jam. There's 15 minutes worth of jam that took place, you know, before we ever started. And that's a first take. You know, we tried to recreate it, but it was never as good as the first time. Well, and in particular, so again, like that previous, the solo on the previous song. So about 30 seconds in where it sounds like the vocals are going to start, then you've got this very melody like guitar line. That's Will Kimbrough. Even though the song is already done and in fact has been released in multiple ways, here comes something that is so melodic that like this sounds like it's the head to the song is coming in. That was all a part of, oh, this jam has gotten so cool that I just need to start this thing. And everybody was fooling around with melodies and playing the thing and nobody realized that, oh, we're about to record this thing till I all of a sudden started singing. And then I went, oh, <laughs> we're playing the song. All right, then. <laughs> I know you come from the very formal, organized Nashville writing. Usually that's that way, right, yeah. Is there any reason that a situation like this, recording a new version of an old song that you know one of the instrumentalists would then get added as a writing credit? Because like, oh, you added a counter melody there that makes it a fundamentally different song, or what's the custom? The short answer is no. Mm-hmm. Everyone takes different views of it, especially in hip-hop music, has really brought that about. But in actuality, what gets published by the Library of Congress is merely the melody and the lyric. You could change every single chord underneath that thing. You can make it all jazz chords, top to bottom. And in the jazz world, people would do covers of things, but then they would take those. One of the things that you'll notice is Coltrane, they all did it. That's the one that came immediately to mind, the My Favorite Things version. But My Favorite Things, he also, he took other songs because he can't do My Favorite Things is still My Favorite Things. But they would take the chord structures from those songs and then just add a completely new melody. And then that was theirs because you can't copyright those chord structures. So they would take traditional show tunes that they had had to play live to make money, you know, and it's like, oh, well, I'm going to just play that and I'm going to jam on it 
till I find something new. And that's how Scrapple from the Apple was written, Ah. you know, a whole bunch of others. So there is that. You could conceivably do that. But in this case, it was just like, okay, we're just doing a different arrangement of a song. Yeah, well, let's go back to the original writing. So this is a co-write, right, with Daryl R. Brown? Yes, with Daryl Brown. The whole reason it exists on this record was, by the time I got to, after writing that first short story, was I'd written three or four more, and a couple of them were inspired by songs. And then I thought, hey, I'll just write a song to go, hey, wait a second, I could have an album of 10 or 12 songs and 10 or 12 short stories to go with it. And my wife rightly suggested, she said, babe, find an old chestnut, whether it was a hit or not, or just a really popular song with your audience, and see if you can not find another short story in one of those. And that will be a cool thing about the record. And Raining on Sunday was the one I found the short story in. That's the other reason I knew that when we were recording it, that we didn't want to do it the same way. You know, you don't want to just repeat yourself. But the original writing of it was a decade before. I think I wrote that song with Daryl in, I want to say, 1998. Do you remember a little about how that dynamic works in terms of, obviously, it's it's a less personal process if it's a co-writing thing. But yeah, say a little about sort of how the ideas get heaped into here. I think I had already had discussions with Daryl about possibly producing the See What You Want to See record. And he's a great songwriter. And so I thought, let's sit down and try to write a song. Let's, you know, let's see how this relationship develops. And the first song we wrote was Raining on Sunday. We got through with that. And I was like, oh, hell yeah. I want that guy to produce my record. He's a really, really creative guy. He can't play a guitar, but he primarily writes from piano, which is always a different thing for me because I'm really a guitar player. So I think that brought different colors to it. He's from Arizona. And so he really understood all of the Mexican iconography references that are in the song. So there was a lot of commonality between the two of us just as human beings. And literally what happened was I was going to his house to write on a Sunday afternoon and it's a gully washer and I've got a jean jacket over my head with a guitar walking up on his front porch and I'm kind of half soaked because I didn't have an umbrella or a raincoat or anything. And I'd walk into his house and I'd like, you know, shaking all of that off like a wet dog. And I went, whenever it's raining on Sunday. And he goes, no, that's it. And I go, what? That's it. He goes, that's what we're going to write today. And I said, no, it's not a title. He goes, oh, hell no, that's absolutely a title. He goes, so we just started with that and got through the chorus first, you know, just about that life's too busy. And then working on the verses, the first verse fell into place pretty quickly after that. But then the one I kept going back to, there's some sort of religious thought processes in it because of Sunday, just because the, you know, it's sort of like you're skipping church, but this is a relationship as intimate as church, just in a different way. So I wasn't afraid to bring some of that to the sexuality of the song. And he's from Arizona. I'm from West Texas. It was really easy to go into. I say, well, how do we describe? And literally what we're describing is if you go all over Northern Mexico and in New Mexico and then in the borderlands, you'll see on people's doors where they've taken what they call milagros, which means miracles, and they're little tiny silver hands and feet and crowns of thorns and sacred hearts. They're a half an inch long. They're little tiny. They have a little hole where you can nail them to a board or to a door. And they'll do them in these beautiful designs. Like I've seen them literally made a Virgin of Guadalupe out of those all nailed to a door. And, you know, and of course, on Saints Days and on Feast Days and particularly Day of the Dead, they put sticks of incense on the doorposts and lintels, remembering your ancestors and warding off evil spirits and, and that kind of thing. And so how can we, you know, use that as the description that goes with, it's cool to me, I don't know if it's going to mean anything to anybody else. Can we make it universal enough that even though somebody doesn't understand that that's what we're doing, it sort of washes over them with a sense of sensuality that they like. So learning that this was co-written by a keyboardist kind of makes sense of a couple of the, the can take care of itself. That harmony, that particular shift. Maybe whatever comes Monday, take care of itself, go. Oh, that, that's using a five minor, five minor chord. So normally there's two things about that song that are really breaking the rules for country music. One is if you use a five minor, you stay five minor. You don't ever use a five major. 
But we use a five major, a five sus, and a five minor all at the same chorus. And I think, yes, him being a keyboard player did help go to that. But I kept looking for odd places to go because of the discussions about the Latin structure. I kept looking for mariachi melodies. And then that's also led me to, even though I'm not the keyboard player, to at the end of the second verse, going into the chorus, there's a minor seven flat five, which is a half, what we call a half diminished. And then it's in the solo too. Yeah, I had that flagged as well. So Yeah. Probably because he'd already talked me into having a five minor chord in the chord. I was like, all right, we're going to go there. Let's build some dissonant tension. And then it was his idea to have do it again as the solo. And he was a joy to work with. You know, he produced the See What You Want to See record and, and is still one of my dearest friends. I, I write with him at least once a year. He lives out in California now. He was living at the time in Nashville. But um, he's a really, really brilliant guy and a very, very soulful guy. And then just can we characterize a little the, the change in tone from the original version to this version, that it's, this is much more mellow. Let ticks just like a time X Never lets up on you Who said life was easy The job is never through It'll run a step ragged It'll harden up I had been through a divorce, remarriage, and then a custody battle where my son got taken overseas to France to live in France with his mom right before I cut that record. And I had been writing all these songs and kind of went to Arista. You know, I was signed in Arista, Nashville, and I took five or six songs that I had been writing to Tim. And he said, these aren't country, but they're so stinking good. I'll help you do whatever you want with them. I will do anything to help you figure out where this belongs. He said, including calling other labels. And he said, but in all honesty, I, I wish you'd talk to the guy, you know, they're starting a new division in Austin. And I said, well, I'm a Texan, you know, that makes sense. And, you know, those guys really fell in love with what I was doing and said, you know, Foster and Lloyd came out of really, you know, punk rock bars in Nashville. I said, that's correct. And they said, we don't want you to be afraid to stick your neck out in that direction because that sounds like you're already heading that way somewhat. So it made natural sense that when we cut Raining on Sunday, there's just a five-piece band. It was me on acoustic, Jay Joyce on electric, and then Rami Jaffe from the Wallflowers was playing keys, uh, Bob Gloud was playing bass, and Chad Cromwell playing drums. And there's some overdubs on that original. I think we had Mac McAnally come in and do finger-picking style acoustic solo on the original because it didn't seem like it wanted some huge rock solo and we wanted to kind of steer clear of cluttering up what Jay had already put on the thing when we tracked because it was so cool. Well, and the vocal harmony, obviously, right? Is, is an overdub that yeah, and then we got Darius Rucker to yeah. come in and sing vocal harmonies, and he's singing a harmony underneath me. And I think one of the changes was I, I always thought, you know, that melody, you know, when I knew when we were going to recut the song, that instead of having a guy singing that part, that I wanted a girl that wanted to be more like a duet. And so I hired Kylie Ray Harris, God rest her soul, to come in and sing uh, the harmony on it. And she did a bang em up job, and I miss her something fierce. She was a great young singer-songwriter who uh, was tragically killed in a car accident in New Mexico on the way to a gig. And it gets more complicated from there. It's been a mess all over the internet, but I miss her. Well, it's a much tighter part that just locks into the, I mean, I wouldn't have noticed this. Oh, I yeah. wouldn't have thought of this, but you know, having heard the new version and then hearing the Darius Rucker version, it's a little distracting. Maybe whatever comes Monday can take care of itself. <laughs> and he's playing free with it, and, and you know, it's oh, Hootie, Hootie, Hootie's on this track, you know, but, but but it's not necessary for the song, certainly. So, right, he's a huge fan and a good friend, and was looking for, and of course, you know, Arista Records was trying to encourage. It's like, do you think you could get him to sing on something? And I was like, yeah, I think we could. You know, I'm calling it. <laughs> 
And I thought he was going to just sing the third underneath me the way that Lou Rawls would have sung. And he had that kind of thing in his voice. And I said, it'd be like, you know, Sam Cooke and Lou Rawls, man. You know, Lou Rawls sang all the harmony parts on all the Sam Cooke records. If you ever change your mind. The harmony is Lou Rawls. And they answer each other, yeah, yeah. I mean, they're answering each other and stuff. And before anybody knew who a Lou Rawls was, that was his gig. He was singing backups for Sam Cooke. So I thought, well, he has that throaty baritone. That might be a really cool sound. But then he just kind of, we sent him a song and kind of told him that, you know, find the harmony that's underneath instead of the one on top. And he's just so loosey-goosey as a, as a harmony singer that he just kind of went with it. And then we were like, okay, all right, that's what it is. So just before we put this song away, say a little about, so this, it seemed like the, especially given that it was written so long ago, coming up with a story that corresponds with this, it's a much looser connection than in the first case here. And that's true of, of a lot of the stories in, in the book. You know, sometimes they're sisters and sometimes it's a retelling or an expansion of the story. And sometimes they're just kind of cousins. In this case, I think they're just kind of cousins. But I thought, okay, I could build a character that has knowledge of that iconography and so i thought all right you know i already got one latino guy who's kind of hiding it i'm gonna make a proud latino woman she's gonna make that iconography on a door in the story and that was what i was like okay what's the love story from there you know because it's a love song it's like how do you get to it and i knew i wanted a fly fishing story because i'm completely obsessed with fly fishing and i came up with a dallas lawyer who's in a crazy midlife crisis early midlife crisis (laughs) So the story is called Isabel, and it sort of creates this Isabel character as, you know, at least for this guy, is his ideal, the solution to all his ills, uh, you know, the thing that makes him reflect on his life. And Well, I think she's his muse. I don't know if she's his solution, but she's been self-reflective, and he never has. Uh-huh. You know, she's actually thought through some things in life. Like, she knows why she wants to practice law other than to make money, and she knows why she wants to do what she wants to do. And she has a spiritual relationship that's born out of the Roman Catholicism that she's raised in, and yet she's sort of progressed in a Buddhist direction. And he's not thought any of this stuff. And so he kind of, as he's seeing the West and falling in love with fly fishing as a contemplative thing, almost the spiritual, you know, level of that, of thinking about that, reading about that, learning about that, spending all that time in nature, he reimagines his life and, of course, gets reimagined with her. And they go through hiccups like anybody falling in love. I mean, she shoves him in a river, you know. <laughs> sure. And so the song is just so much more general and universal. It's like this is a song that could apply to some scene between these characters in the course of their relationship, but of course could apply Correct. to any number of other people. And other than this Mexican iconography stuff, like that's the thing that seems like the specific thing. That's the only real connection other than I can see them getting busy on a Sunday afternoon sure, <laughs> sure. because it's raining and he can't go fishing, you know, <laughs> you know. All right, let's jump back in time for the third and final thing that we were going to talk through in some depth here. Nobody wins. So one of the singles from the first most successful, most single laid solo album, Del Rio, Texas, 1959, came out in 1992. I see it was co-written with Kim Ritchie. Do you want to say a little about the song before we play it? I loved writing that song. It was the first song I ever wrote with Kim Ritchie. I've said things that I'll regret It won't be easy to forget Scars take time to heal Before another bitter word gets loose I was hoping we could call a truce Cause nobody wins We both lose Hearts get broken and love gets bruised
It don't matter who's wrong or right Honey, love ain't black and white It's the way I feel about you All I want to do is hold you tight I can't take another angry night When nobody wins We both lose Hearts get broken So this went through, it occurs three different times in your catalog that you read the entire album acoustically later. There's a live version, which I think I actually like the live version better than either of the others just because it's faster. Like it finds the rock. <laughs> I don't know where the live version came from. I wonder where that came from. Uh, oh, so that everybody uh, getting ready for the big show, what's that album was taken from a bunch of different shows. Are you ready for the big show? Yeah. But that's just because it's a hit. And so it's going to end up on uh-huh. you know a live record. We redid the entire record acoustically for the anniversary of you know that first record coming out. It was a huge record for me. I mean, if I don't play Nobody Wins and Just Call Me Lonesome at a concert, they're going to start throwing stuff. I'm going to have a riot on my hand, you know. And I could absolutely do nothing but that record straight through. As a matter of fact, I've been sort of nudged by fans. It's like, what are you going to do? Like, you know, Delia, Texas, all the way top to bottom in your concerts kind of thing. So it is extremely popular. It was a huge seller. The biggest compliments I get really are by how many other young artists have told me that, you know, when they were in high school in, you know, 1992 or three, when that thing came out, that they were like, that's what I wanted it. That's the kind of country music I want to make. You know, it's traditional, but it still feels like a rock band playing traditional country music. And I don't actually have it in my notes here, but I I thought I read somewhere. Is that the harmonies? Is that Mary Chapin Carpenter? Is that? That's Mary Chapin Carpenter. Yeah. And much to Kim Ritchie's chagrin, I might add. Because <laughs> she wanted to do that part? Oh, she wanted to sing so bad on that song, but she wrote it with me, and it was the first song we ever wrote together. And always, listen, in Nashville, when you get together and you write with somebody, everybody says, oh, yeah, the first one doesn't count. Just get to know whether you like the person and whether you like the, that you can collaborate well together. And it's like, you know, you're not going to write anything that's worth a damn on your first time out. It's like, well, yeah, <laughs> that ain't true. So, yeah, she was supposed to sing, and I was on tour with Mary Chapin. And, of course, Arista Records once again goes, hey, do you think Mary Chapin Carpenter would sing harmony on the song? And I said, well, she's pretty low alto. Let me find out if she can get on, sing above me on it. If it'll work, and send it to her. And I sent it to her, and she goes, oh, my God, yeah, I'd love to. But then Kim Ritchie ended up singing on another song that was a, also a, a hit single off of that record called Easier Said Than Done, and she sang with me. And we actually, just this year... Uh, through doing about a 10 city tour and we're probably going to do some more next year this one is a co-write how generic <laughs> are the sentiments in terms of <laughs> of i think i might have written once or twice a very personal song that ended up you know being a co-write that somebody else helped with it's more likely when you get with another person and you're just you know trying to figure out what's ringing that it's going to be you're creating some sort of specialty song it's not your soul there <laughs> often you're writing to a title 
But I have to say that co-writers have gotten used to the fact that I'm going to go absolutely in a personal direction. You know, writing with Guy Clark and sort of sitting at the feet of Guy in town and Rodney Crowell, I mean, one of the things I learned is that your job was to make a piece of art, and that was going to involve going digging around in your soul, and it might not be all that comfortable. And I really count that as a great joy. And Bill and I both watching those guys encourage us in that framework and in that mindset too was you know, a really, really good thing. And so I stand there on her back deck of her house. Once again, I was going to her house instead of her coming to mine and drinking a cup of coffee. We haven't decided what we're going to write. It's 10 o'clock in the morning. We're just kind of having a cup of coffee and saying, hey, before we try to sit down and do anything. We'd been friends for a year or two. And I said, I had a big fight with my wife last night. And she said, yeah, my boyfriend and I had a terrible fight last night. I was like, oh, God. And then she said, nobody wins that shit. And I said, that's what we're writing today without the that shit part. <laughs> that would have added a little... <laughs> It's in the snare. It's hidden. It's hidden in the reverb. <laughs> Might have kept me off country radio in 1993. So. <laughs> so this is a much more traditional arrangement, but it's still got, I don't know, I wasn't listening to country radio in 1993. So I don't know how typical this sort of sound. I mean, it's got this bright, uh, here comes the sun sort of intro guitar and got your pedal all over the place. Do you remember anything about sort of how this arrangement came together? Actually, there's two things about it that are, that are really cool. One was is that Tim and I got through writing the first verse and the second verse in the chorus, and we knew, like, okay, this either needs to have a solo and, you know, repeat the chorus, or is there something more to tell? And I said, yeah, let's write a bridge. And she said, I was hoping, I was kind of wishing, she said, and, and this was very, fairly common in country music and even in pop music, that she said, you know, I've never written anything that modulated, that where, you know, you raise a whole step yep. or a half step or half, whatever your choice is. And I said, really? And she goes, yeah, I was just thinking, it's like, instead of just having the thing, boom, you go up, a step, you hear the chord and bang, you go up a whole step, let's write a modulation and through the chord structure, which is for me, guys like Jimmy Webb and his ilk of those 60s LA writers did that so artfully, you know, Burt Backrack. If they were going to modulate, they wanted to figure out a musical way to make it make sense and do it. And so I said, well, let's write a modulation, you know? And she said, okay, that's cool. The other cool thing about that was that Nobody Wins is the demo. Steve Fischel, who played Steel on Raining on Sunday on this latest record, who had been friends with for, you know, 30 years, he was a budding producer at the time and had produced a couple of singles and a couple of records for Indie artists and Aristo was trying to figure out who should produce my record. And I said, I really love what he's doing to Chim Dubois. And he said, I do too. And he said, but he doesn't have a lot of a track record. And I said, well, I want to co-produce it because, you know, in Foster and Lloyd, we had produced our own records. And so and he said, I'm cool with that. And he said, but let's go do some demos with Steve and let's go write some songs, go sit down with him, see how this works and, you know, go do a demo session and let's see if it clicks. If you guys come up with something, we did a demo session and, you know, booked the players. And luckily he said to the engineer, he said, run at 30 ips. I'm sorry, you got, that's ancient technology. We're cutting to analog tape. 30 inches per second is faster and therefore less noisy and better sounding than 15 IPS. And he said, if, you know, I'll pay for the extra tape my own self. Is what he basically, you know, he was going to fork over the 75 bucks for the extra amount of tape we were going to need. And we got through, Jim Dubois said, there is absolutely no reason whatsoever to recut that song. That's a hit single right there. That's how Steve got the job. And, you know, producing that record for him ended up getting him lots of jobs producing records because of the hit singles off of it. Well, there's some nice variation between the verses and thing. I mean, the fact that you bring in mandolin in the second verse there and this kind of chick, 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 and, the, you know, to get into the, after the second verse, to get into the chorus there. And it really, having that modulation then makes it more natural to do that. Mary Chapin Carpenter are really belting it at the end in uh, answering you. She's got to get way up. That's way up there in the stratosphere for her because <laughs> she's an alto. And so she really had the belt to be able to hit those notes and you can really feel the emotion in it. That part was pretty exciting. I mean, she wasn't there when we cut the track, obviously, but hearing her do it and have to get up there to make it happen, that was really fun. 
Well, that's fun to hear that you and your co-writer were both having issues at the time that fed into this. That's absolutely about as true as it gets. Both of us were just going, okay, let's write a song that says nobody wins. That's the whole slamming door. Although my book publisher laughs that she introduces me. She goes, I got to tell you, you know, when do we do bookstores and stuff on tour now? What's weird is that I do bookstores in addition to doing, you know, just concerts and you know, theaters or honky tonks or coffee houses. And so she always introduces me. She said, he's one of my favorite songwriters of all time. She said, but I got to tell you on that nobody wins thing, he got it wrong because whoever slams the door just wins a little bit. <laughs> I mean, the whole album, well, quite a lot of it, the songs are downers. It is the downer of a record, yeah. There's no question. To me, country music was always supposed to be more, if you have more happy songs than you have sad songs on a country record, I think you're doing it wrong. Because the great part about country music is you can be riding down the road and you hear a really great country song and it's a sad, I mean, it's a weeper. You can go, oh my God, I am so much better off than that poor sniveling human being on the radio. It's cathartic. You know, you can go, oh man, I'm not doing it as bad as I thought I was. That guy, he's really doing bad. Well, yeah, to wrap this up, let's talk about the more recent single. We've been talking about this recent album. This is so far away, 2017. You've released a single since then. It's a version of an old song. Say a little about it. Godspeed is a lullaby that I wrote for my oldest child. It was actually on the See What You Want to See record as he was moving to France. It's really written from the perspective of, I don't know when I'm going to see my kid next. And so the lullaby part of it is that, you know, God hears amen wherever you are. I'm, I may not be able to put you to bed and say prayers with you, but here's something you can listen to that reminds you that I love you no matter how far away I am. And recently with the disaster at the border of how our government has has dealt with an immigration and a really a refugee crisis because of what's happening in Central America, I just got pissed off. And, you know, I thought, well, I can get on the Internet and yell. And Lord knows the Internet needs more gray headed guys like me yelling on it. I mean, that's, you know, that's not really I didn't think that would be productive. So I did something my dad taught me, He said, you know, if you get really mad, take a deep breath before you do something stupid. And I thought about it and I thought, you know what? I'm a border boy. I was born and raised in a bilingual home, even though we're not Latinos, we're Hispanicos, even though I come from an Anglo, I'm you know, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, but I was raised in a home. You spend four generations on the border, you're going to be raised in a home where people speak both languages because you have to. So I, you know, rewrote those lyrics, both in Spanish and English, with a dear friend from back in Del Rio, one of my old girlfriends, Debbie Hernandez, who now teaches both Spanish and English at high school, literally in my hometown, and thought, you know, I want to write this about the journey. So we changed the lyrics up some that really talks about using the water is wide, which is a, a song. It starts with Agua Sanchez, and this basically is saying wide waters and hard roads is where it starts. And it's about that journey, looking for safety. We don't have any books to read you know, on the journey, but I can sing to you as part of the lyric as well. And so I put it out, and I gave any of the proceeds that come from that single go to Raices, Texas, which helps immigrants with legal affairs and then also helps immigrants of all stripes often asylum seekers, whether their status is documented or not, they help out with new arrivals to our country. And so it's my way of sort of planting a flag and just saying, look, we can argue about what we want to do and the politics of what we want our immigration system to be. But can we all at least agree that we should treat everyone and in particular children who are in our, our custody with decency and humanity? All right. And if folks recognize this, but didn't know you did it, it's, it's probably because of Dixie Chicks version right? earlier. Although I saw, I didn't know Kenny Loggins covered it. That's crazy. Yeah. And now it just got covered by Mark Broussard and his version is beautiful. It's all piano and orchestra. It's amazing. All right. Godspeed. Dulce Sueños. Thank you so much, Radney. Really great talking to you. The pleasure's all mine, man. Caminos duros y aguas anchas Vuelas alto en tus sueños 
Duerme bajo de la luz de la luna Y te amo Godspeed, mi hija Dulces sueños, pequeñita Oh, my love will fly to you each night on angels' wings. Godspeed, sweet dreams. Rocket racers all took her down. Superhero está descansado. No tenemos libros en este viaje, pero puedo cantar. Godspeed, mi hijo. Dulces sueños pequeñitos. Mi amor volará hacia ti en las alas de un ángel. Bendiciones, dulces sueños. Dios bendiga a mami muñequitas Dios bendiga a papi y las estrellitas God hears amen wherever we are And I love you Bendiciones mis hijos Dulces sueños pequeñitos mi amor volará hacia ti en las alas de los ángeles. Bendiciones, dulces sueños. Godspeed, sweet. Thanks so much to Radney, a great storyteller. As listeners probably know, country is not my central focus musically, but I do really enjoy doing episodes with anybody who's really thoughtful about what they do. If you check out the blog post corresponding to this episode at nakedlyexaminedmusic.com, I will link to the other versions, in some cases more famous versions of these songs by the Dixie Chicks, by Keith Urban. He's really well covered and much beloved in the country community even if his old records sold better than the more mature and actually better albums that he's putting out now. My next episode will not be country. It will be on the band uh, The Monochrome Set with their singer Bid, a British band much beloved by Morrissey and got their start with Susie and the Banshees and that other new wave of goodness. Then after that, we're going to be swinging back for more country and then more prog. And I just interviewed one of the guys from Einstrutzende Neubauten, if that name means anything to you. German experimental band. So lots of good stuff coming up. And if you appreciate it, if you want to make sure it continues to happen, as always, I encourage you to go to patreon.com slash nakedlyexaminedmusic, 
where you can get an ad-free feed. There's bonus episodes for some of the older stuff. If enough of you sign up, I will start recording supporter-only audio with more of my thoughts about things that I've been listening to. So think about that. I hope you have a wonderful holiday season or a wonderful day whenever you are listening to this. Keep on musicking. This is Mark Linton Meyer signing off. <laughs>